are you prepared to take payment uh, uh, that is not that you know a payment for goods and services that is not U.S. dollars? Mm-hmm. Not at this time. Not make believe money. It's a fabricated money. At this point, I don't. I have a, one feel, like a feeling away. I feel like there's no reason to. My favorite form of. Uh, Currency is something I can hold in my hand and I can spend as I wish and I don't have to sign a paper that says I spent it. There's something material about like them having paper bills. I wouldn't have a problem exchanging value. I probably at this point in time would not invest in, in a speculative market. We believe that it is money and we are trying to not just prove it to others but also prove it to ourselves. Mm-hmm that Bitcoin is money. In the early 2000s, scenes like this were commonplace. Half a dozen friends playing computer games for 24 hours straight. One of the requirements for these kinds of meetups was a solid connection to the internet. Like moths to a flame, these meetups would inevitably happen where we could get quick, reliable access. In a brief fit of what some would playfully describe as techno-paganism, we had gathered up some old computer parts and set them on fire as a mock sacrifice to an unnamed computer god, this in exchange for higher frame rates and less hard drive crashes. A study at the time showing that 98% of schools were connected, the general public having far fewer opportunities with as little as 43% having access to the internet. Most of the internet connections at the time were still using dial-up modems, which were hardware devices that used the traditional phone line systems. Gus, what is this main artery of the information superhighway? Every business, no matter how large, no matter how small, will be on the internet in the year 2000. It's the primary way that people will look up information. It will replace the yellow pages as we know it today. Are a lot of people just getting on to the internet because they feel that they have to get onto the playing field, so to speak? Well, it's very hip to be on the internet right now. Who says online users are a bunch of anti-social geeks? Look, here we are in this nice cafe, drink in hand, friendly people, and we're surfing the net. It's hard to imagine for the younger generation, but 24-hour access to the internet was not guaranteed where in most households you had to choose between making a phone call and connecting to the internet. People my age may remember a time when they were doing something pretty important online, only to be kicked off when their parents picked up the phone. Although half of the country had no access to the internet, its importance would be no less than revolutionary. And until reliable access came with DSLs and cable modems, this was simply a burden that the young techno-enthusiasts had to bear. Fast forward to 2017, we are in the middle of an information revolution where so much importance has been thrust upon the internet, it's hard to imagine daily life without it. We have adapted the way we do business and adjusted our social lives with this new ubiquitous access. And due to the speed at which the innovation is happening, we've entered a new era in which some people refer to as the age of disposable technology. A common trait for gamers is the love for movies. Movies like war games. Shall we play a game? Oh, The Matrix. Take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. One of my guilty pleasures is a movie called Hackers from 1995. And perhaps one of the most underrated techno thrillers, in my opinion, is a movie called Sneakers from 1992. Holy cow. In the movie, Ben Kingsley's character expresses an idea, maybe a bit cliche, but I believe it to be more true now than it ever has been in the past. The world isn't run by weapons anymore, or energy, or money. It's run by little ones and zeros, little bits of data. It's all just electrons. I don't care. There's a war out there, old friend. A world war. And it's not about who's got the most bullets. It's about who controls the information. What we see and hear, how we... There's no doubt that the internet has brought about many technological revolutions. And as we strive to understand what these changes mean for society, a social revolution has happened unlike the world has ever seen. Another thing that comes with gamer culture is the hardware. Brightly colored, highly customized gaming rigs are fetishized in the community. A key component of these gaming PCs is something called a GPU, or Graphics Processing Unit. This is a very complex piece of hardware and is essentially responsible for the quality of the gameplay. If you want your game to be faster or better looking, the speed of this GPU is very important. 
On a trip one day to the store to buy some of these computer parts, I was hit with a sense of deja vu as GPUs were once again flying off the shelf. These cards were not going into gaming PCs. They were going into a different type of machine called a cryptocurrency miner. But perhaps the, uh, the nicest thing of all is this recent innovation by the commercial banking company of Sydney. It's a little card that brings you instant cash. Wait a second or two and out drops your instant cash. $25 of it. The machine retains the card and then it is forwarded back to the client by the fastest possible means by the bank once the account has been debited. Um, it only pays $25? Only $25, yes. Well, what happens if somebody wants more than $25? Well, in that case, uh, I think it'd be best if they make arrangements with their local bank manager. You are about to witness history in the making. The deja vu I was having was from about four years earlier, when the term mining rig was synonymous with those that were using PCs to mine something called Bitcoin. This time around, something called Ethereum captured everybody's attention, and these GPUs were the only thing in town if you wanted to mine the stuff. With very little knowledge and no research on my part, I grabbed the few remaining cards off the shelf that were even able to mine Ethereum. Shortly after this insane demand at the local stores, they implemented a no return policy for open boxes. The stores knowing full well that these cards weren't going into gaming PCs. They were going into cryptocurrency miners, where they would be ran at their maximum specification for 24 hours straight. So why mine Ethereum? With the Bitcoin craze nearly four years ago, I was experiencing something that the crypto circles called FOMO, or fear of missing out. Some people were making real money using their own PCs to mine Bitcoin. I ignored it then, but this time I didn't want to be left out. After my Ethereum rig was up and running, I started to do some research about what cryptocurrency is, what Bitcoin is, and what Ethereum is. I read books like The Blockchain Revolution by Don and Alex Tapscott, The Age of Cryptocurrency by Paul Vigna and Michael Casey. I also read American Kingpin by Nick Bilton, which is a chronicle of Ross Ulbricht, the infamous Dread Pirate Roberts from the Silk Road. And while a website like the Silk Road could have existed in the past, a decentralized, pseudo-anonymous cryptocurrency like Bitcoin certainly helped with its rapid adoption. And with this knowledge come some important questions. Do I see a future where I use cryptocurrency on a daily basis? In order for cryptocurrencies to succeed, do fiat currencies have to fail? There's no doubt that this new technology will bring about changes, and if the proponents of cryptocurrencies are to be believed, it could represent a fundamental shift in who controls the money. But with these changes could come chaos. Chaos on a level that mankind has never seen. But technology in and of itself is agnostic. It's up to human beings to give it labels like good or bad. Uh, it does uh, require to think seriously as to how in the future uh, we, or perhaps more specifically our children and grandchildren uh, will be able to realize the potentialities uh, that we would like our own society to enable us to develop. Enter the age of cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrencies, do you know what cryptocurrencies are? Well, golly, oh, God, cryptocurrency. Okay. Cryptocurrency. That's, I saw that at that fair once, and they've got this cryptocurrency thing. They <laughs> fold them money things up in the smallest little shapes. I saw a guy make a swan that was awesome. You're that me. is the awesomest <laughs> cryptocurrency folding thingy I've ever seen. <laughs> is that what you're referring no. to? <laughs> Mike, <laughs> you're killing me, man. To better understand what this means for society as a whole, I decided to seek the opinions of people around me. Friends, family, even business owners. Anybody who would be willing to give an opinion. One of the first interviews I did was at a local electronic surplus store, which is a wonderful time capsule of forgotten technologies. Um, so what cryptocurrencies have you heard of? Let's just start um, there. There's Bitcoin. There's a number of Asian versions of it. It's not as regulated as the governments would like in the sense that they don't have control over it. As, and so you can 
move your money around and stuff. So there's 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 parts of it that some governments don't care for in that sense that because it seems like there's more. Uh, uh, it seems like it floats a little bit more in the sense that, like if my favorite form of uh, currency is something I can hold in my hand and I can spend as I wish and I don't have to sign a paper that says I spent it and there's no trails on it. That's a, a to me, as a open source of currency that works, American dollar bill. That's kind of what most of the world runs on. You can take a dollar bill anywhere and show it to somebody and they'll know what it is and they can spend it. The opinion and, uh, given by the store owner was pretty typical. But even with the lack of technical knowledge from most of the people I interviewed, the idea of cryptocurrencies in general allow them to form an opinion about what it means for them. I travel a lot. I travel 75% of my time. Right, and so I you, hate... you're totally, you know what exchange rates, you have to buy different well, forms Well, you just get currency. ripped all the while. I mean, the exchange yeah. rates are terrible. They have uh, added fees, and every time I pay with a credit card abroad, I get a shitty exchange rate and right. a transaction fee, a foreign transaction fee. Right. So One of the benefits that these cryptocurrencies promise is to eliminate the need to exchange currencies when you want to do business in another country. There would be no need to exchange dollars for euros, or vice versa. You would simply use the digital currency that everybody accepts. I think the problem is that there is a connotation associated with Bitcoin right now, which is slightly nefarious. Right. And um, it might be Bitcoin or it might be a future version of Bitcoin that is more legitimate, that might well be the, the key to opening this up. Just, the whole thing has its value by, because of people's participation. Right. That's it. And which, hey, our money's backed by nothing. It's so just, once we went off the silver, uh, uh, what do they call it, the silver currency, right. we now have nothing but goodwill backing our money. Right. So Bitcoins really is all about the goodwill of the people using it and that they believe that if they spend that, they'll get what they're paying for, or if they invest it, they'll get what they're paying for. When I go to Canada, if I go to Canada, I change my money over to Canadian money and stuff right. like that. And if you time it just right, you can make a little bit more coming back than when you go in. You know? Yeah, yeah. I used to trade stocks, so I know a little bit about that. It's going to get to the point where we have total electronic funds. I have to have my card reader for my phone. Yes. And just so happens yesterday my phone broke. No. So I come here with a new phone and it's not fully set up, so I haven't been able to use my card reader. <laughs> so in a sense, I'm playing with Bitcoin type money. Right but because somebody's not really giving me cash. But it's a system that is so in place that everybody relies on it. Let's throw it away for a master plan run by a master state. Would you care to reply to that? I certainly would. Government can't control everything without controlling me, what I can say and what I can't say. And I mean police control that tells me where I'll work, where I'll live, and all the rest of it. Just words. The people know what they want. With a haphazard friend. Oh, I loved you. I guess I never knew what love was. Oh, I loved you. Guess I never knew. Oh, I guess I never knew. I'm gonna end up doing the whole. I know that Bitcoin was a currency used on. Uh, is, is currently a currency used on the internet as a form of currency that you can exchange <laughs> that you can exchange um, for goods of various types. Yeah, I know a couple people who are really excited about Bitcoin. Like, I don't know much about it. I can't say. Explaining the technical nature of cryptocurrencies was a struggle, even with people who had heard of things like Bitcoin. However, after explaining some of the basics, most people were willing to give an opinion. Bitcoin. I know that there's that one. Um, I've heard there are others. Cryptocurrencies, what is it? It's algorithm-based money that you can basically move tax-free. What information is attached to that transaction? Uh, who it comes from and where it goes. In the form... In what level? Who it is. In the form... It, okay, it goes from a, a wallet. How do you get said wallet? You just go get one. You can make what's the qualifications? What, what information do you have to hand over to get a wallet? I guess the thing that I think about first, because in a lot of ways to me, Bitcoin and the idea of it, uh, quite liberating. 
The appeal of Bitcoin to libertarian-minded people was definitely a major factor when interviewing the general public. By its very nature, the Bitcoin network is distributed all over the world and is not controlled by any single person or government. The, the World Bank is bullshit, and I'd love to see any, us be able to get away from that. As far as I know, it's a complete no-go. And because of federal, because of federal, because of federal law, yeah. And honest to sh those f***ing crooks waste enough of our goddamn money anyway. This uh, person, who wished yeah. to remain nameless, has a reason to be upset with current federal uh, law concerning money and the sale of marijuana. Here in Oregon, recreational use of marijuana is now legal. And although it's considered legitimate commerce inside the state, money from these sales cannot be put into any bank for fear of federal seizure. Faced with potential legal issues, sellers have little choice but to deal in cash. Bitcoin and, you know, other cryptocurrencies like that could be an answer, but like with everything, you get good and bad with everything. But we're people, we, we learn how to exploit, and there are always those out there that are going to always look to exploit no matter what. The last I saw Bitcoin was like $360 or something like that. Right now it's $2,500. God damn! Um, I was wrestling with the idea too, I, <laughs> son of a... How That's when, when I'd start seeing it to where, yeah, if I all of a sudden I walk into a f***ing 7-Eleven and it says Bitcoin accepted here, I'm going to go, holy sh where the f*** have I been? One of the reasons for the chaos that we could see is a fundamental shift in the power of who controls the money. From governments creating the money that the citizens use to a digital currency created by the people for the people. The vast majority of commerce conducted around the world is done digitally, and it has been for some time. But with this new revolution in information technology, a new concept has been realized. A digital currency created by the citizens and not controlled by the governments of the countries they live in. This shift in power is a direct threat to countries around the world. And due to this threat, they've been forced to create entirely new legal constructs around these cryptocurrencies. As their popularity explodes, countries around the world are struggling on how to deal with them. While some are open-minded and impose little restriction on their use, some see it as a threat to their own currencies and have banned their use entirely. While there are very few countries in the world that have given Bitcoin legal status, a handful of them have deemed it illegal within their borders. Morocco, Bolivia, Ecuador, Kyrgyzstan, Bangladesh, and Nepal see the threat of cryptocurrencies that they cannot control within their own borders. And while this is a short list, there's no doubt that more countries will sign on to the ban as cryptocurrencies gain a foothold in the economic engine of the world. As far as the legal status of cryptocurrencies within the United States, the federal government deemed Bitcoin and by extension other cryptocurrencies to be property on September 2015. However, in a Reuters article on September 2016, a judge ruled on a criminal case involving a hack in JP Morgan Chase. As part of her ruling, Judge Allison Nathan stated that Bitcoin fits the definition of funds and was quoted as saying, Bitcoins are funds within the plain meaning of the term. Bitcoins can be accepted as a payment for goods and services or bought directly from an exchange with a bank account. They therefore function as a pecuniary resource and are used as a medium of exchange and a means of payment. While this ruling does not change any specific legal status of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general, it may give hope to some that one day these technologies will be seen as more than just property, but as currencies in the eyes of the government. Life today is too complex. People are too dependent upon each other. Jobs are too highly specialized for us to do business by barter. This convenience of modern money has evolved from an age-old search for a satisfactory medium of exchange. Out of the simple barter of primitive people, spearheads became one of the first articles used as money. Shell as it turns out, one of my co-workers had not only mined cryptocurrency, but used it in legitimate commerce. Articles have been money to various people at various times. I should talk about my system first, probably, uh, if you want, because I, I originally had two gaming computers for some odd reason. Um, I had a GTX 970 and R9, R9 290, and I got those mining right off the bat, and I was making, I think at that point, around uh, $12 a day-ish. That's pretty good. No, it wasn't that much. It was yeah, $5 a day. Just that, kidding. It was $5 good. a day at first. It was $2 in my 970 and $3 on my 290 
Yes. Yeah, so well, I guess technically I bought a or sold a laptop cover for my friend back in 2014, back when that was a big was blowing up back then, and that was my first foray into cryptocurrency. That was my first understanding. Actually, I first learned about it in my macroeconomics class back in back in high school. We started talking about it. We started talking about what it was and never really understood it that much back then. They never really taught it to us. We just discussed it, you know, offhand. So you actually sold something? I sold, I did sell. I sold, it was for $3 worth of Dogecoin. So he sent me an email for a Dogecoin wallet and I went to their website, signed up for it. And then I sent him my code thing and whatever it's called. Um, and then he sent it to me and it sat there. And then the site got hacked a few months later and now it's gone. gone. And it's all gone. I went to the website a few months ago to check and see what it's worth, and it's worth virtually nothing. Yeah. And that's what that's. Was the, what was this? There's there's both there's good sides and bad sides to to it all. I think, for me, as being you know, very utilitarian, I think there's a really good argument to be made in this making our whole money system more efficient. Because cash costs money. You have to have the big giant armored trucks and all that fun stuff and those all that stuff. Remember, I worked in. Orchard fast food. They had the, you know, the guy came and there's these, these, there's there's these big safes and there's a whole process and there's people that train. There's a whole industry, you know, that that employs people and is all about cash. It's about having cash on hand for businesses and that costs lots of money. Part of the kind of newness of of cryptocurrency is the inhumanness of it. I think is really kind of the scary part is like because we've always money transactions have been face to face. Either you physically give someone, you know, cash. I think if you look at the history books, you can see unre unregulated currency can lead to absolute disaster. Even if you know the current systems stay in place and the current governments don't do anything, there's a possibility that you know the cryptocurrency market, whatever it becomes, whatever it's you know whatever it transforms into, and if it becomes more widespread, and that could have a huge crash if, because it's unregulated. There's no no one in control potentially, even if they're you know, but there's no there's no one in control. So there's no one in control. Many people are attempting to use computers to replace man. I am much more interested myself in using man and machines as a working combination. I believe that some of the future is already fairly clear. If there is any mystery in the computer revolution, let's be sure that the mystery is located in the right place. In spite of its magnetic memory, complex circuitry, and so on, the mystery is not in the machine. The idea of Bitcoin was culminated with a white paper first published in 2008 by someone with the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. This paper, first published in 2008, laid down the blueprints of what would be called a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Although changes to the protocol have been made over the years, the Bitcoin development team attempts to adhere to their interpretation of the white paper. The word interpretation seems to best suit the current climate in the Bitcoin community. Factions have formed in the community, and because these disagreements are technical in nature, they represent fundamental changes to the Bitcoin code. This has resulted in something known as chain forking, or a fork. The most notable fork of the Bitcoin blockchain thus far is Bitcoin Cash. Loved by some and hated by most in the Bitcoin community, nevertheless is a fully operating Bitcoin blockchain. This is possible due to the open source nature of the Bitcoin code itself. And although the fork would be called contentious by some, it is no less valid. Nevertheless, these forks have resulted in heated debates. Beyond the technical side, it has resulted in infighting in the community, with many people drawing lines in the sand. You don't have to look far to find the polarizing opinions on either side. Roger Ver, one of the public faces of Bitcoin Cash, is usually on the receiving end of most of this discontent. Hello, Roger Ver, legendary Bitcoin investor. First guy to do a lot of things, has a lot of Bitcoin. It's only been out for about three weeks, and it has, what, the third or fourth biggest market cap in the world at this point. Uh, the <laughs> fact that the blocks are happening, you know, are already 100 kilobytes, and they're happening a lot more often than, than at once every 10 minutes, that shows that a lot is already happening on it. Oh, hold on so. a second. I, t I said that you liked Bitcoin Cash, and then you told me not to put words in your mouth. But now you're promoting the heck out of it. Whoa, no, 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 no. 
We know what the real Bitcoin is because it's a live network. We all can point at it. We all can agree on which one. It's we're Bitcoin talking Cash. About. Okay, we, we agree. Talk about. <laughs> no, Bitcoin Cash is Bcash. It's Bitcoin Cash. It's a whole new separate network of people, right? You just but admitted that the original the one, core version of Bitcoin, is not what's described in the original Bitcoin white paper published on Bitcoin.org and written by Satoshi Nakamoto. If the Bitcoin core version of Bitcoin isn't in line with the original Bitcoin white paper, I don't think it's fair to call that one the one and true and only. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. It's not clear whether or not any of the active cryptocurrencies today will be around in the future. But due to the status of these cryptocurrencies in the public eye, a power struggle is underway to see which one will be dominant, at least in the near future. There are currently 489 contributors to the Bitcoin code, and because it's open source, anyone at any time can look at the code. To say that no one is in control is mostly correct. However, of the 489 contributors, only a handful of these have the technical knowledge and skill to make real contributions to the Bitcoin code. And while these changes are made to the code, a consensus must be reached by the Bitcoin community as a whole in order to be adopted. So who is Satoshi Nakamoto? It's been almost nine years since the publication of the Bitcoin white paper. And to this day, nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. It's been theorized by many that Satoshi Nakamoto is not a single person, but in fact many people who collaborated on the initial white paper. Even in the 21st century and the dawn of the computer age, technological innovations, specifically Bitcoin, are not immune from a creation myth. Some people think he's in hiding or dead. Some even theorize conspiratorially that the idea of Bitcoin was an invention from a government think tank. With the absence of its creator and the attention around Bitcoin, a few people have claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto. One man in particular, a Mr. Craig Stephen Wright, has claimed to be Satoshi. In the Bitcoin community, the proof that's needed is obvious. With research done by Sergio Lerner, it's theorized that the mysterious Satoshi is still in control of more than 1 million Bitcoins. Since the addresses of these tokens are visible to the public, Simply moving the Bitcoins from these original addresses would solidify the claim. However, to this date, no one has performed this miracle, and Satoshi Nakamoto's anonymity remains intact. So, I think Satoshi is a sellout, and I think that he could burn his private keys now and not risk the future economy of the world with an unknown party holding 10% of it, who may have given those keys to his kid, and his kid might be the next Hitler. Or he may have gotten a mental illness and gotten wacky himself. You know, Satoshi could still be here if he was alive. He could still be guiding us. He could still be helping us. He could be renouncing his control of his keys, but he's not, which means he's either a bitch or he's dead. Those are the only two options I'm aware of. With an economy of this size, naturally we have great problems. Do you know what our biggest problems are? And what you want done about them? Well, everything from the milk pail to the farm itself. I had to save enough to buy them, and then take care of them, and then save enough to replace them when they wear out. And beyond that, I have to save enough to carry me through the bad years. And when it comes to taxes, well, I'm the guy that pays them too. One of the major obstacles the cryptocurrencies will have to overcome is the legacy of the current financial system and the biases of the current and former generations that use it. As with the interview with the store owner, it will be difficult at first to convince people that a new type of payment system will work. A payment system with no central authority, not backed by any state or government. This may be viewed as not only difficult, but almost impossible by people that hold these biases. Everything is relative to experience. So for those people who are left on the planet who lived through the Depression, their view of, of safety and security and what they want to be able to see is very different than a 24, 25-year-old who lives on, on, everything is on their iPhone, everything is in the cloud, everything is in the air, and they feel perfectly comfortable. You know, the people who lost everything in the SNL scam, the people who lost their homes a decade ago. You know, each one of those events in time that are separated by a half a generation to a generation changes the perspective and the perception of how safe is my value, how safe is my future. People are greedy. 
people uh, find ways to run the crease rather than staying on the surface. So, and there are a lot of people out there who who great, get great delight and great profit by breaking the bank. So, you know, I, I think this will ultimately become a standard of currency at some point in time. If there were a run on the banks today, within an hour, there would be nothing. There's just not that much physical currency exactly. out there anymore. So, you know, the, the financial institutions are keeping their own types of ledgers. They just are one hand away and one extra person in between and a government behind from what we're talking about right now. We're not buying thumb drives and memory with chickens and magic beans anymore. Every everything Some moves. People might Some be, people I might be know. trying, <laughs> but you know, everything moves in a piece. And today, getting consumers to to move in a piece, you need volume and you need mass to make something like this happen. It has to be recognizable, and what's recognizable are the retail giants right now. What's attacking it from behind is, is the, the security issues that exist on the web now and within the internet now and you know the losses that people have experienced in, in the whole concept of if I'm not exchanging this monetary value for something tangible or for something else with monetary value, then my, my record of wealth is kept somewhere. I think that needs to be solidified in, in people's minds for them to be comfortable. I would, it would have to be solidified in my mind. I mean, I've read about blockchain, I, I, because that's the first thing that pops up in my head, is when, when you are investing online and not using a, uh, what we would consider to be an institutional investment vehicle, who keeps it? But as an exchange for goods and services and an exchange for value of another kind, um, to me, it's just a vehicle. That's all it is. Money, currency, the movement of value, it's all just a vehicle, and it really doesn't matter to me. I, I read this funny blog that they categorized the, the miners out there as a, uh, you know, a group of people who don't trust each other. And so basically, that is the, the self-writing system. Um, that if you know if everyone is keeping everybody honest because they don't trust each other, then the system will stay upright all along. Um, history doesn't always prove that out to be the best um, organization for human interaction. When the gold rush is over, then I think that's when people will really be able to see what this, how this exists as a utility. Brave men came from the north, the east, the south, the west. By the tens, the hundreds, the thousands. Like the literal gold rushes in the past century, this new cryptocurrency gold rush is no less important. Like the past with prospectors venturing out into unknown territories to strike it rich, cryptocurrency miners are investing huge amounts of time, money, and hardware in the hopes of making a profit. This new blockchain technology may be catapulted into legitimacy by those miners who are willing to take the risk. And with this risk comes great reward. And in August of 2017, Bitcoin passed the $4,000 mark for the first time. A welcome sign for those who view that cryptocurrencies have a future, no matter the current political climates in countries around the world. Like many activities enjoyed by the general public, enthusiast groups pop up to support the community. Of course, cryptocurrencies are no different, and so I decided to seek out the opinion of one such group, a local group near my hometown called PDX Crypto. Restaurant, they could totally use it if they were accepting Bitcoin. Makes sense. People get to get on the Wi-Fi, their wallets update almost instantly, and then they start signing. The overall vibe of the meetup was mostly positive. 
an enthusiastic group with the shared knowledge that they were all participating in something big, something potentially world-changing. You guys have Bitcoin Cash sitting somewhere, and if so, what did you do with it? As I mentioned earlier, the Bitcoin blockchain has forked several times. And even in this local group, the politics behind the Bitcoin forks was visible. This is an important topic among people that hold Bitcoin. If you have access to Bitcoins before the fork, you essentially have control of tokens on both chains, meaning what once was one Bitcoin is now two. There was even some speculation about what Bitcoin prices may be in the future. $25,000 of Bitcoin by 2024. I don't know, that's pretty, that's pretty lofty goals. The members that host these meetups were very knowledgeable. And not surprisingly, a few of them make a living solely on mining cryptocurrencies. I, I mine Ethereum uh, pretty much full time. And I sell and trade Ethereum in the Bitcoin markets. It's like my entire business plan. And I've just been trading Ethereum, Bitcoin back and forth, and I can make $1,000 a day. Just okay, so I'm kind of taking over the questions. So I'll just talk about it later. To gauge their level of enthusiasm, I asked them how much they thought the average person's net worth should be held in cryptocurrencies. Uh, I mean, if, we talk li if we're talking liquid value, probably over 80% is in crypto. Really? So not you personally, what would you recommend? <laughs> The response of 80% is a clear sign that their aversion to the risk is outweighed by the belief that these blockchains will be major financial instruments in the future. I mean, this is how rich people have been doing it for ages. You know, they, they make a bunch of money off of the devaluation of the dollar because they're holding uh, non-liquid commodities and real estate and art. So the people that are going to use it for more utilitarian use are the people that don't want to pay fees for like Western Union and things like that? Of course, it wasn't all just Bitcoin. There was a fair amount of talk of other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum. Ethereum is different from Bitcoin and that it's not just a medium for exchanging value. It also involves something called smart contracts. Although the idea was around before Ethereum was created, Vitalik Buterin engineered the use of smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. At its core, the smart contracts platform acts like a distributed computer system, able to store and execute code on the blockchain. What, the, the whole point of this blockchain, from what I understand, is to remove a uh, third-party trust that the transaction will happen. Uh, uh, and and how, do you, how do you undo or stop something that is genuinely wrong, that everybody agrees this was wrong, like, let's say, Ethereum? What if a contract was just written wrong, and then you have a, a, the hack where some, some Ethereum was siphoned like, off because the of, the, yeah. of, a, of an exploit? This question was specifically about a hack on the Ethereum system. It involves something called a DAO, or a Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAC, standing for Decentralized Autonomous Corporation. The first time I heard this acronym, my mind immediately went to the movie Idiocracy. With the CEO of the Brondo Corporation. How come nobody's buying Brondo the thirst mutilator? Half the country works for Brondo. Not anymore! And the stock has dropped to zero, and the computer did that auto layoff thing to everybody. We're all unemployed! Why is this happening? I, I think it's because... While a DAC or DAO could certainly be written about in a science fiction dystopian novel, with a distributed system like Ethereum, these concepts are being experimented with today. In an article titled Understanding the DAO Attack on Coindesk.com, shows the catastrophe of one such experiment. This attack was so severe that it caused a split in the Ethereum development team, ultimately resulting in a fork of the Ethereum chain. This was proposed as a way to nullify the stolen tokens in the attack. But with this fork came controversy, the looming question of how and when these forks should be implemented, and who ultimately has the authority to do so, has caused strife in the community. Today, there are two Ethereum chains. For reference, my mining rig mines Ethereum, not Ethereum Classic. Ethereum Classic is the blockchain that did not nullify the DAO tokens. Some people believe that this chain is more trustworthy by not yielding to the pressure put on them by the company that lost the tokens. 
However, at the time of this writing, the Ethereum Classic chain is only worth about 5% of the Ethereum chain. And although these chains can perform the same tasks, this perceived trust has not resulted in a higher value token. And the story doesn't end there. On November 8 of this year, a company called Parity issued a security alert. A developer outside of the company claims to have accidentally locked up nearly $300 million of Ethereum. This was due to a weak implementation of something called a multi-signature wallet, where more than one person is required to authorize a transaction on the Ethereum platform. It has been speculated since then that this may not have been an accident, but a deliberate act. Regardless of the outcome of any investigation, however, if no fix can be found, these funds will be locked up for as long as the blockchain is in existence. And a fork of the Ethereum chain may be the only way to recover these tokens. I was able to get an interview with somebody that makes a living mining cryptocurrency. I really didn't know what to expect. How big of an operation do you need to make a living? I was about to find out as I entered the mines of crypto. So how many, how many cards are running in this stack? So this stack right here, six servers, six cards each, 36 cards, uh, 1200 watts each. Rig. This mining rig was consuming about 7500 watts. For reference, 7,500 watts is about the same power as six microwaves running 24-7, and the heat coming off of it was almost unbearable in the small apartment. Money should be something of value. The value should be obvious and uniform. Money should be divisible. Money should be durable. Out of such trying experiences, gold and silver emerged as the most durable, most convenient, most satisfactory money. Later, governments took over the exclusive function of coining money. So today in the United States, any money is counterfeit and so worthless unless issued by the federal government. You are printing coins that didn't exist before by mining on these machines that I'm mining with. And you're doing basically the same thing that the Federal Reserve is doing. Um, it's money. I mean, you can call it a commodity, you know, cryptocurrency, but it, it's got all the same principles of money. Well, the gaming hardware, you know, we're using these GPUs to play Battlefield, to, you know, play Counter-Strike, Call of Duty, whatever you're into. And so gaming and mining is going to be almost synonymous because GPU mining is pretty much where all of mining started before people got these uh, application-specific, you know, uh, hardware devices. As Bitcoin mining became more popular, faster hardware was required to make it profitable. This is due to a piece of the Bitcoin code that regulates the difficulty depending on how many people are mining. As illustrated in this graph, the more people that mine Bitcoin, a demand for more computational power quickly followed. It began with CPU mining. Essentially, they were mining Bitcoins with the very machines that wrote the code. Later came GPU mining. Without the overhead of a general computing platform, these GPUs mine Bitcoin many orders of magnitude faster than CPUs. But with the demand for higher profitability, the industry adapted with something called Application Specific Integrated Circuit, or ASIC for short. With miners adapting to this new hardware, it essentially became unprofitable to mine with anything less. However, all cryptocurrencies are not equal. There are a number of algorithms that are used to compute these cryptocurrency blockchains. And not all cryptocurrencies can be mined with ASIC machines. Some can even be categorized as ASIC resistant. And although publicly available, some cryptocurrencies are not mineable at all. Well, yeah, I mean, if you pay more attention to what's going on with the ASICs right now is they can be made three times faster in the same production year. And you really want that arms race when it comes to the stability of your currency and the way you want to keep things profitable for miners. You want to keep things stable and, you know, ASICs threaten that. And I guess that's why Ethereum decided to be so um, ASIC resistant. But you can see that I'm mining one currency because it's the most profitable and only because it's the most profitable. And then I'm just converting it to something else. Does that make me selfish? Absolutely, you know. Um, do I care about the utility of the currency? Absolutely. When I say that speed and microtransactions are what's so important to me, uh, the ability to send money internationally across the world and 
10-15 minutes for a very cheap, non-existent fee. One of the pathways we may be seeing going forward is a combination of companies like PayPal using Bitcoin to facilitate the transactions that occur on their centralized networks. You've got these Bitcoin debit cards right now that will either use Visa or MasterCard. Well, what if we had something else? It just had nothing to do with those guys. When you can't beat them, join them, right? right. But eventually, we're going to break away from that and create our own product where we won't rely on those traditional payment systems at all anymore. What I truly believe in, I believe in uh, Bitcoin for its utility, uh, not for the greed, uh, you know, the tulip mania, you can call it, where this people fear they don't know if it's a bubble. There are two main benefits for people who choose to mine Bitcoin. The first is to create a valid supply of tokens on the blockchain. As new blocks are found on the chain, the miners receive a bounty in the form of newly minted tokens. The second is to provide the computational power to make the transactions happen on the network. Like traditional payment systems, vast amounts of computer hardware are used to transmit the digital money. In the age of cryptocurrency, the miners can set a transaction fee. This fee is received for adding transactions to valid blocks, although not realized by most of the people that mine Bitcoin. To receive a guaranteed payout for the computational power they offer to the network, most miners participate in large mining pools. These miners receive a percentage of the computational power they offer to the pool. And by doing so, most miners do not receive any benefit from transaction fees. Instead, these fees go to the owners and operators of these pools. As of this writing, nearly 70% of the Bitcoin's computational power exists in Chinese mining pools. This dominance is most likely attributed to the cheap power and first pick of the mining hardware that is manufactured in China. This is a trend that will no doubt continue into the foreseeable future. Pools have done more to destroy the distribution of uh, censorship resistance in Bitcoin than anything else. And the more money and the more participants and the more value that we've had, the more centralization in China we've had. And you can't even negotiate with these guys. They're not on Twitter. They're not on Reddit. They're not interacting with me. They're not interacting with core devs. They don't care to talk to you. They just care to run their mining software and have it auto flip from whatever chain is the most profitable. As cryptocurrencies in general become more popular, it's obvious that the overwhelming amount of value is being driven by speculation and not by the mining operations. I asked this question at the meetup, and the answer I got was no surprise. Was oh, it's almost for. all speculative. Okay, but, but yeah. do, you, do you see that as a hindrance for people's adoption of no, it to, of it to be used? Adoption, really? Because people I think we are at the very foothills of a. I don't think we've even started bubble yet. Okay, I, really? I think I think it's. I think there will be a bubble. I think it's going to go very high, probably seventy thousand dollars or whatever in the next year or two, and then it's probably going to have a big correction after that. We see that interest starting to happen. That Wall Street interest or whatever is, and I think that's why I, I totally agree that we are going to have a bubble. I mean, I don't think Bitcoin's not a bubble. You know, people are like Bitcoin's never a bubble because whatever. But no, I think we're gonna. I just don't think we've even really started the bubble yet. <laughs> As Bitcoin reaches new highs, it's easy to draw correlations from big bubbles in the past. One bubble that people are quick to point out is the historic tulip mania in the Netherlands in 1637, where demand for exotic tulip bulbs quickly outpaced the supply. Due to high demand, people started trading in contracts for the tulip bulbs, essentially making deals without having physical possession. Fueled by rampant speculation and sellers hoarding the supply, a single tulip bulb was eventually worth as much as an entire house. Shortly after the peak, the price of these exotic tulip bulbs crashed almost to zero, leaving the holders of these contracts bankrupt as a result. The price of Bitcoin could certainly be in a bubble. The difference between then and now is that somebody could quite easily take possession of the Bitcoin they are purchasing. However, in late 2017, a few companies in the US have begun futures trading in Bitcoin, possibly leading to what some have dubbed Tulip Mania 2.0. Oh yes, I, I think it. I think for its utility, I think it's currently overvalued. I mean, I don't. I don't think it's worth six thousand dollars per coin for the amount of usage you can get out of it. I, I have told people just leave your coins on Coinbase. You know, which is basically a bank. You're not really any different than using a bank. It's, it's regulated. It's got you know insurance, and you know it's like a bank. It's what you're used to. 
there is one important distinction about owning cryptocurrencies in general. By purchasing on an exchange, you agree under contract that the exchange holds your cryptocurrencies. This gives the exchange the ability to make trades with inside of a closed system. To take ownership means you specifically need to be in possession of the private keys. Without them, you have no control over the movement of those tokens. However, the benefit is clear. If you control the private keys, the tokens can't move without your authorization. But this comes with a vastly higher level of responsibility. If your keys are lost or compromised in some way, there is no method for recovering them. There is no central authority that you can contact to help you recover your funds. This is one key feature of cryptocurrencies. The concept of data hygiene or the cleanliness of the data and records you keep will be a big factor in whether or not this is a blessing or a hazard. Well, uh, like you say, you'd like to see the technical level go up. I, I'd like to see the personal responsibility level go up. I think we've gotten a little too, oh, well, if, as long as I use my visa, I can call up visa and tell, you know, and cancel my order. Right, so now, how, do you think, you know, that, how do you see that playing out? We get securing a physical thing, securing something that's, you know, ones and zeros feels very different. very different even even though we've been doing it for quite a while i mean you know most people use their you know debit card to pay for stuff that's ones and zeros that's you know the bank is storing ones and zeros it's not storing cash for all your you know and but the people who don't have access to banking don't have that it's this disparity created you know this economic disparity that People in third world countries, most of them don't have access to a bank. They don't have access to money creation. That disparity right there is eliminated with cryptocurrency because you have a bank in your pocket. Because I live in the United States, one question comes to mind. Who are these cryptocurrencies for? They seem to solve a problem that doesn't exist yet. Because the traditional banking systems are so easy to use, why do we need this new form of money? A couple of years I would have agreed with that quite a bit. Uh, Andreas Antonopoulos talked about that a lot, you know, in videos he did a couple of years ago about how adoption will probably, you know, really be fast in Africa and stuff. But that it hasn't really, I mean, it has happened. There's been adoption, but it hasn't ballooned like we thought it would. Yeah, and While doing research for Bitcoin, one name stands out, Andreas Antonopoulos. And to the enthusiast, he is the Bitcoin evangelist. I often say that where Bitcoin and the other open blockchains are today is approximately where the internet is in 1992. Simply by means of downloading an application, you can become part of a giant platform of trust that doesn't care who you are or where you came from, that doesn't require permission to participate or innovate. In Bitcoin, I control my money. I have complete and total authority over my Bitcoin. It cannot be seized, it cannot be frozen, it cannot be censored. My transactions cannot be intercepted, and they cannot be stopped. The children born today will not know a world in which banks exist. They will not know a world in which paper money exists, any more than many of the young people in our industry today have no idea what the world used to look like before the internet. So I, I think it's, it might be somewhat explosive like that. Once it gets over a certain hump of that it's just going to be, well, that's just what everybody does. That how, it just, how, how, closer, how close do you think we are? I don't, I don't know. It's that it's what, what, when that trigger point happens, I think it'll be, you know, five years. I don't go back and say, man, I hate myself, you know, 10 years ago because I didn't know about this. Or I, I don't, that's like, that's who I was. I learned to be who I am now from that. I, and I think, and I, I see that with currency too that okay you know hey we use this fiat stuff it wasn't great it it was better but it was better than i mean you know when you had to carry around gold that was a pain <laughs> it's very heavy stuff uh paper money created an ability to do more commerce more 
more wealth was generated in the world with fiat currency than probably could have happened if we kept carrying around silver and gold. I think that, and you know, when I say, I mean, my bets on Bitcoin as being the main thing for 20 years, um, but I, the one area in this last couple of years has kind of been an indication of that is that there, obviously with that much value sitting in something, there's going to be a lot of people that want to have a piece of that or control that or, you know, whether it's governments or individuals or corporations or there's going to be a lot of, <laughs> you know, just like there's lots of fights over oil, you know. To me, eliminating, I, just like we have a separation of church and state, I think a separation of money and state is necessary. I, I think it is maybe even more important than the separation of church and state. That money and the state should not be intertwined. It's, you know, if you're going to have a state at all, it needs to serve the people and they're not serving when they're running the money. <laughs> so, I'm not we're free to try any new idea, new product, new service, a, a new anything. If anything went wrong with a master plan, the result would be a national disaster. And every man, woman, and child would suffer for Wait a minute, wait a minute. We know all we need to know about how to produce things. What we don't seem to know anything about is distribution. I could care less about Bitcoin. I don't know why I, I, don't know why I said anything about it. JP Moore moves six trillion of dollars around the world every day. We don't do it in cash. It's done digitally. If it can be done digitally with the blockchain, so be it. But it'll still be a dollar cryptocurrency. What I have an issue with is a non-fiat cryptocurrency. I, I could care less what Bitcoin trades for, how it trades, why it trades, who trades it. If you're stupid enough to buy it, you'll pay the price for it one day. I've also told people that it can trade at $100,000 before it trades to zero. And, and the other thing I've always made about Bitcoin, governments, and this is not a technological statement, governments are going to crush it one day. Governments like to know where the money is, who has it, and what you're doing with it. And you, in case you haven't noticed, okay? <laughs> Although not at the meetup, I received information about a couple who are about to take a once-in-a-lifetime journey. They agreed to do an interview at a garage sale where they were selling off their last few possessions in preparation for a journey around the world. Being members of the PDX Crypto Group, this journey of course involves cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin. Okay, well, my name is Raphael Hawksley, and this is... Summer Brocktrup. The journey in a brief summation would be that we are setting off on an adventure around the world, and we are trying to fund this entire adventure and live off of one single Bitcoin. No cash? No cash. There <laughs> might be an emergency fund here or there, just in case. Well, there's definitely an emergency fund because this is an experiment. But the idea right. would be to see how much of it we can do just purely on Bitcoin. And right. that's what we really want to be talking about. Like to yeah. eat, to sleep, to travel, mm -hmm. whether it's airplanes, trains, or automobiles, or buses, it'll be one Bitcoin and chipping off of that one single bit of cryptocurrency there. The first time that I went to a Bitcoin meetup here in Portland, Oregon, the first time I went, I didn't know anything about it. I was very much new to all of it. And yet the amount of help and happiness, <laughs> to sound a little bit cliche about it, that I found there was just so wonderful. The people there were helpful, they were insightful, they were full of knowledge. And so I th thought to myself, is it like this around the whole world? Yeah. Pretty much. We always knew we were going to embark on some kind of adventure, and it's definitely evolved. It, was, it started out with something completely different. Even the locations we were planning to go to at first were very different, yeah. and then eventually decided kind of on a, you know, a flight path, if you will. And then this Bitcoin thing kind of took over, and we both really just loved it. And that's now making its, you know, the mark on where we're actually going to go and how we're going to travel. Yeah. China is a huge country, as you can see, and there is a lot to do and see. And as I started looking at you know, what we were planning to do there, I realized that we really needed to spend at least more than a month there. So we'll be kind of zigzagging back and forth like this in China um, before heading out to Taiwan. 
um, and then the Philippines for Christmas and New Year. So the total journey time from Portland, Oregon here on October 8th through China, down and then back up, and then through the Soviet Union, through Russia, I should say. This is say. an old globe, by this the way. This is a very old globe. <laughs> But back up through there to Poland should mm -hmm. take us about 12 months, wow. one year. Ambitious. Yeah. Very Quite ambitious. ambitious. In Asia, there's been an explosion of interest mm -hmm. in Bitcoin. However, now with the recent crackdown, it could be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So there's a number of backup plans, just in case we don't find someone who has Bitcoin and local currency and is willing to take Bitcoin for local currency, the backup to that would be an ATM. There are a number of ATMs, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency ATMs, generally throughout the larger cities in mainland China and Asia that will be able to go and get the local currency. Even in the age of smartphones and the ubiquitous access to the internet that we all enjoy, traveling abroad presents its own difficulties that have to be overcome. Without reliable access to the internet in these foreign countries, it's almost impossible to trade these cryptocurrencies. However, it's not as difficult as it sounds. Well, so fascinatingly <laughs> enough, Summer here has found a fantastic workaround. Or actually, yeah. not even a workaround, a direct method of usage. Yeah, it's, it's what the is intended Google for. Fi yeah, project. Yeah, like, uh, Project Fi is, in, uh, well, it's only for Google products. So if you want like the Nexus or the Pixel devices, it's the same plan you'd have in the United States, but you can use it in 150 countries. Um, so talk, text, and then data. And it's way cheaper than Verizon or any of the other, those other ones here. In, so yeah. that's what you're going to rely yeah. on, yeah. hopefully? Yeah. So as long as the phone has a battery, we're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> For most, daily life now requires some kind of connection to the internet. Because of this, the industry as a whole has risen to meet these demands. But what we take for granted in this country is not necessarily guaranteed in other parts of the world. Although the internet in the United States is mostly owned by private companies, in this country we walk a fine line between government regulation and corporate interest. I believe in free markets, but I'm also weary of the slippery slope that government regulation represents. Some nations are openly hostile to the internet, with state-owned connections that are filtered at the borders. This can make it difficult for new types of internet services to reach these parts of the world. If the citizens choose cryptocurrencies over fiat currencies, and since these systems can only exist online, the abolishment of physical currencies could spark a debate on whether or not the internet as a whole is a human right or just a privilege. After all, cryptocurrencies in general mean very little to those that can't get online. We do have or a backup phone. Or confiscated. Oh, so. is that, does that happen? It could. I, you know, just eat now you got me worried. <laughs> Right at the top, as any basic human need, we're going to need shelter, safety, food mm -hmm. in our belly, hopefully warm, we'll see. We'll need those types of things. And the overarching difficulty and challenge will be to pay for it directly with Bitcoin. Um, my concern actually has nothing to do with that. Oh. I'm surprised that we didn't share the same concern. How so? I, I was concerned that you know, given the volatility of Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies for that matter, right. that how long will it really last for us? Yeah, well, I actually just quit my job last week. I was an Android developer for a small startup here in town. Um, pretty new to the tech world still, but... Code, code monkey? I, I guess you, if you know, I did feel like a monkey sometimes. Right. Like, client says this, okay, you know. <laughs> you know, but it was, it was fun, uh, a little stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I was an architect. The residential homes, that cool. type of thing. To the true believers of these cryptocurrencies, it's nothing less than revolutionary. They believe that it's time for things like Bitcoin to overtake traditional payment systems. To them, it seems like the next logical step in this social revolution that we're all experiencing. I agree with that statement more than anything else. And that's saying something because I agree with everything else. <laughs> I agree with that statement. It's Do you think it's going to be revolutionary? Absolutely. Yeah. Not just currency, but assets in general. Assets, real estate, heck, even voting. The whole decentralized aspect of cryptocurrency, of the, of the triple ledger of blockchain will mm -hmm. revolutionize more than I can imagine. 
So funny enough, we are yeah. setting out on our two-year anniversary. Uh, yeah. We will land you, in China. Did you forget last? <laughs> God I damn it! So. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be a fascinating test, of course, of oh, the yeah. relationship. Because... Everyone's been saying that. <laughs> Polska, przygotujcie. Jedziemy do was z Chin, z Ameryki, i wszystko na jeden Bitcoin. Papa. <laughs> Poland, get ready. We are heading on over to you from China, from America, and all on one Bitcoin. And I said bye-bye. <laughs> As mankind has allowed the internet to happen, the internet in turn has allowed things like cryptocurrencies to come into existence. And even if things like Bitcoin don't make it in the end, it's almost certain that we haven't seen the last of them. In whatever form the internet takes in the future, it's almost certain that mankind will continue to experiment with new concepts. And whether you're a skeptic, a pragmatic, or a true believer, for the former, it may just be a matter of time. But for the latter, it may just be what they've all been waiting for.